أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله على ما كان الحمد لله على ما يكون الحمد لله على ما سيكون الحمد لله أولا وآخرا وظهرا وباطلا الحمد لله نعمة ويكافي مزيدة ويسفع عنا بلاءه ويسفعه يا ذا الجلال والإقرار أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وهذا أولى شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا وعظيمنا وقدوتنا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And I say unto him No one but him uh, I bear witness to the oneness of Allah And I also testify And believe in the messengership of Rasulullah Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam uh, we thank Allah for bringing us together this morning to have a crucial discussion on rape and gender-based violence from the religion perspective. Uh, I'm going to be taking the angle of uh, where rape, non-violent rape, the misconception in the religion of Islam. Uh, generally, the issue of rape is nothing but a crime against humanity. Rape is the unlawful sexual intercourse or any other sexual penetration of the vagina, anus, or mouth of another person, with or without force, by a sex organ, other body parts, or foreign objects without the consent of the victim. Rape, as far as Islam is concerned, is one type of zina but with, it is involved hiraba, and hiraba is waging war against the sexual autonomy of individual. That is rape. And zina in Islam is haram completely. It's unlawful. It is discouraged by Islamic perspectives. And it is believed that rape is much more greater than Zina. That is why Hiraba is involved. And Hiraba is waging war against humanity, waging war against sexual autonomy of an individual. Now, my focus on this is the issue of non-violence rape. Generally, we pay more attention to the issue of violent rape. But in this regard, um, the non-violent rape is less spoken about, and that is the more reason why I am most interested in the issue of non-violent rape. Generally, we believe that rape involves coercion, it involves violence, it involves force. Before you can have someone against her will, you must have given and consent, you must force the person to be able to penetrate in her. But the non-violence rate is what I'm concentrating upon. Al-Quran has discussed the issue of rape as al-fahsh, shameful act. Shameful act is, uh, rape is part of fawahish, shameful act. That is number one. And at the same time, Islam has seen rape as facade, a complete wrongdoing. Facade. Facade is part of corruption. And Islam is seen rape as a higher level of corruption, higher level of shameful act, waging war against humanity. That is how Islam sees rape. It is part of zina, but much more greater than zina, and it is punishable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, and the facade and fahash, I will fawahish, shameful act, is haram in Islam, completely unlawful, punishable at the face of sharia. Now, the non-violent risk that I'm talking about, number one, Let's look at violence that, I mean, a non-violent rape that involves spiritual power. That is number one I'm trying to explain here. 
a non-violent race that has to do with spiritual power. If anyone is interested in penetrating any woman, he go about searching for a particular spiritual power. And when you have this power, you can as well, I mean, order the person to do anything against her consent, against her will. So when you have spiritual power, sometimes they, 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 they keep something in the mouth and they speak out, commanding the person involved to do whatever they want her to do, and they thereby come and penetrate. This has no I mean, physical violence, but it has psychological violence. You don't have to struggle with the rape person. All you need to do is to command her to do whatever you want her to do. This is part of rape without violence. People possess different kinds of power. They call it black mom power and what have you. You use this to order somebody to come close and you do whatever you want to do with such a person. And this, it, this happens by having the woman against her consent, against her will. Once this happens, it's an act of rape without violence. The person will lose his sense and the person will obey the person who is using spiritual power to command her on anything that he is interested in, in her. So this is one of the non-violent rape that I'm discussing. And it is punishable uh, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rape is rape. Whether violent or not violent, rape is rape. That is number one. Anyone that possesses a, a, a spiritual power that will make him to subdue a woman into having sexual intercourse with her against her consent is termed as non-violent rape. Number two here is child abuse. Luring underage children, it's like laughing a child and the rest of them, you start having a rough play with a child who is innocent completely, who doesn't know what is going on at all. The child will feel as if such a person is playing with him. And Sallallahu Alaihi wa alayhi wa sallam says, Laysa minna man lam yarham sagirana wa la yukrim kabirana. Whoever fails to be compassionate, to be merciful with the king, will not be part of me, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa sallam. It has been taught in Islam that we should be kind with the children, we should care for children, not to lure them into what is against their humanity. So, I mean, child abuse by having her to play a rough one with an adult is a non-violent rape. So luring a child of underage into this act is an act of rape without violence without violence at all, because the child is innocent. She doesn't even know what is going on at all. And everything lies in the hands of the adult who is learning the child into such an act. So it is part of a non-violent act. Number three is taking advantage of someone who is unconscious. It's also a non-violent risk. For whatever reason, for anyone that is thrown into a, I mean, a state of unconsciousness, of course, the person temporarily will lose her sense. And you take advantage of her unconsciousness to have her, to penetrate her, to have sexual intercourse with her. Of course, she doesn't really know what is going on. It requires no violence in whatever form and you take advantage of her. By so doing, you are raping her. You are a rapist because it is completely against her self-autonomy. And this happens in different forms. Somebody can fall sick and the sickness can throw her into a state of being unconscious and people take advantage of this. It's just like someone 
who have a, I mean, a very strong and heavy sleep, you can take advantage of someone who is fast asleep or who is thrown into a state of unconsciousness. And when this happens, we will say you are taking advantage of her unconsciousness to have sexual intercourse with her against her consent. Don't forget, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Mangashana falaysaminna, whoever dismisses us, whoever cheats us, is not part of us. It's not part of the ummah of Rasulullah. So the person has been cheated. The unconsciousness of our condition has been taken by having sexual intercourse with her. This is part of a non-violent uh, rape that I'm talking about. Then another one is drug facilitated rape. When someone is drugged, you drug somebody. Someone can come visiting for one reason or the other. An occasion can bring you together with certain women, a woman, and you decide to put drugs in her drink. When you do this, she lost her senses. She lost control. She becomes intoxicated. She doesn't really know what she's doing at that particular point in time. You thereby take advantage of her by having sexual intercourse with her against her wish. This is part of a non-violent rape. And it is against the teaching of Islam, taking advantage of a brother or a sister against her, I mean, her condition is tantamount to a rape in the religion of Islam and it is punishable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even, if, even without rape, to throw someone into a state of uh, unconsciousness is against the teaching of Islam. So having a woman through a drug, facilitated one, to have her is, an, is a form of rape without violence because she has no power to struggle with you in any way. Whatever you want to do with her, you do it with her comfortably because she is under drug. She, she cannot really gain her strength. She cannot really gain her senses. And you take advantage of this to have her straight away. Uh, another one is institutional abuse. It's another form of non-violent rape. Uh, it happens in our institutions, in our universities, in the tertiary institutions, where female students come around asking for one help or guidance or whatsoever. Academically, it is possible a female student uh, has a problem academically, and she can't, she has to come to one of the lecturers for a guidance and the lecturer takes advantage of this. For example, a final year student in any university who has problems of her GP and what have you. And she must, she must pass through that particular paper for her to graduate for that year. Using this advantage against her is a non-violent rape. What we understand by rape is having a woman violently or non-violently against her concept is what we call rape. Someone can succumb to an advancement from a rapist without violence at all. So I just have to do this for I have no alternative. For her, I have nowhere to run to again. For this is the only opportunity for me to get what I want. And it is popular say that you use what you have to get what you want. It is completely against the teachings and principle of Islam. So you taking Thank advantage you of this, lecturers are like lecturers are like senators in the higher institution. Meeting them for one help or the other, they take advantage of whoever, whoever comes around them. And by so doing, you will have taken that advantage against her consent and it becomes a non-violent rape. So these are, so, for whatever forms of help anyone is seeking from you, 
The Prophet said, Man satara mu'minan, satara Allah for Yom Al-Qiyamah. He said, Irhamu man fil ard, Irhamu kum man fil sana. Be fast, be merciful to people of the heart. Allah, who is everywhere and in the heaven, will be merciful to you. So people take advantage of uh, other coming to them, seeking for a form of help. And they take advantage of their condition to have sexual intercourse with them against their wish. And when this is when this happens, we say this is completely haram in the religion of Islam. We all open our palms towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking Allah for a particular help. So no one can live in a village. No one can become an island. You can be in need of help at any point in time. So seeking help from a brother does not give such a brother an audacity to take advantage of that condition that nothing goes for nothing. That is our popular thing. Nothing goes for nothing. Before I can do this to you, you have to do this. And if uh, the, the, the person who falls victim has no alternative no option to that particular problem of that situation, then she succumbs unwillingly in order for her to get what she really wants. Even though that is on Islamic, you can only seek Allah's help and you can seek help from other fellow human beings. You have to look for all the available means to get yourself help. If I able to do this, it will be better. But some, because we, that's what we call individuality, not everyone can go into a particular situation, a particular difficulty, a particular pain. When they run into this kind of problem, they cannot bear it for a longer period of time. They have to go elsewhere to look for a help. And when you come for help, people take advantage of this. The fact that someone agrees that you, that you can sleep with her does not mean it is with a consent sometimes situations warrant this to happen. For example, a woman who is roaming about looking for food for herself and her children and someone comes across her and the person and the woman asks for a help. How do I feed my children? For one reason or the other, somebody can fall victim of this. And you know what it means. Someone who is hungry. A hungry man is an angry man. So someone who is hungry who has nothing to feed upon will surely go to any lady to feed herself and her children. And this is where people take advantage of these poor people, vulnerable people, to have un I mean, ne unnecessary sexual intercourse with them, thereby breaking into their sexual autonomy against their consent, but they just have to get this too. So taking advantage of this is in a form of non-violent rape. And it is tantamount to uh, a, a kind of rape that is against the teaching of Islam. And it is punishable Thank in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank, Thank you very much, Joshua. Thank you very much. Haji Saudetu, are you online? Hello, Haji Yes, 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 I'm on, I'm on. Yes, would you like to add anything to that, please? Thank you very much. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, uh, I want to start by thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this opportunity mm -hmm. and to also thank all the panelists who are here to contribute to this very critical issue in our society. I, I know for a fact that everyone on this panel is already concerned or has expressed concern at one level or the other of the problems we face in this. Now, listening to the last, the first speaker, I think what we need to take away and contextualize is that rape and other sexual gender-based violence are underscored by four major issues. First is the context. From all the things that have been said by the speaker, you can see there's a context, either a context of trust, a context of need, or something which places the second item of vulnerability on the victim. 
And then the next thing that comes is there's a power play. In most of the incidences that, uh, or rather the formats of nonviolent rape that has been discussed by him, you find that there's a vulnerability and then there's a dominance. Because if you look at the spiritual, you look at the pedophile or the child abuser, or you look at the person taking undue advantage in a conscious and unconscious state. We have this context in a doctor-patient relationship, it is there. We have the pedophiles, the children, we know what it is, the child rights act speaks to it. We have the spiritual influence, at least if you take any 10 numbers of sexual gender-based violence in this country today, four would be in the context of spiritualism. That means there is a reality that is attached to spiritual influence for sexual gender-based violence. And then the issue of, you know, under the influence, you also have the institutional abuse. So in all, there's a relationship of dominance and of course, a breach of trust. So when we discuss these things and when spiritual leaders and, you know, people of authority in our society speak to this, they must see these things in that context. It is beyond theology. It is also beyond just the medical context of a woman has been, uh, you know, entered or a, a child has been abused. We must look at what is that trust that has been breached. And I think uh, the, 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 the more we go into this, the better we'll understand the context as well as the vulnerabilities, the dominance and the breach of trust that is associated. But I think on, on the whole, I want to say that a very important point has been made that rape in any form is a crime and it is punishable under the laws of Allah and the laws of the land. And that we must keep in mind. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much.